Welcome back. In the first video, we looked into how we actually do those forecasts um, and we looked into some specialized forecasts. Now um, we're looking into how the end users actually are using the forecasts and um, who are those end users actually. Um, so we're looking also into time scales, evaluation criteria, and then I have an example from trading. Who needs forecasts um, of wind power? Essentially everyone um, who is somehow connected to wind power. That means, first of all, the transmission system operators in the areas with high wind penetration. But there are more and more areas in the world that now get high wind penetration, especially in the future um, where we are going towards the net zero targets. Um, and I've, um, have I'm, I'm having a few examples um, of these transmission system operators here. The main target of a transmission system operator is, of course, to keep the grid stable and to um, provide uh, electricity. So then, of course, if you own your own wind turbines um, or your own wind farms um, or operate those, and especially if you want to trade that power on the market, uh, then you're also having a big interest in getting those wind power um, uh, forecasts. Also, if you're having, if you're an electrical utility and just want to push the wind power through your net, um, then you also would be interested. Um, also, because um, sometimes wind turbines are connected more to the lower levels of the electricity system. But then, even if you don't own any wind turbines yourself, if you are trading on a market where um, you have a sizable share of wind power, then you also would want to know how much wind power I'm expecting tomorrow because that will affect the price on the wind market. Um, as we are seeing in the um, energy crisis here in 2022, the uh, price of um, electricity for the households can actually change from two kroners per kilowatt hour in Denmark um, up to six or seven kroners per kilowatt hour. Um, and a lot of that has to do with how much wind and solar power we're currently having in the grid. Different users have different cost functions and maybe you've seen in the previous slide that some of the names I've put there um, in the different categories are the same in, in several lines. So even within organizations, uh, you can have different needs for forecasts uh, because you're having different um, functions related around wind power. So trading, um, unit commitment, um, if you're combining wind and hydro power plants, then you want to have a week ahead forecast um, for your hydro storage values. If you're operating wind associated with batteries, um, then you're having the same thing more on a daily pattern. So different um, cost functions are um, important for different use cases. What are the timescales that we can actually use? Um, this is a slide from the Met Office and um, they have a number of things here for, um, for the longer timescales, for more the climate related timescales. Um, that are important, especially if you're looking at wind resource assessment um, and planning policy for a multi-term um, wind resource assessment um, planning uh, process. But also if you're an operator or a trader, um, if, if you're in grid management, then you're typically looking at this minute to week um, time schedule uh, that is important for the actual operation of your power system. How do you evaluate whether you're actually getting a good forecast? Uh, some of the early days um, we had the mean absolute error, um, the root mean square error, difference be being mean absolute error treats every error the same, the root mean square error um, takes the uh, emphasizes the larger errors which is in most cases um, one that is more imp important um, and we normalize those errors with installed capacity um, because that's easy to look up in a lookup table um, rather than the average uh, power production that at least for outsiders um, is not easy to get. We also seen in the first part that we can do probabilistic forecasts and um, to evaluate those um, we need specialized um, forecast criteria uh, like um, the continuous rank probability score, CPRS um, or the variogram score. We've recently put out by the IEA Wind Task 51 forecasting for the weather-driven energy system 
that all in a book form. Um, the IA Wind Task is notionally the biggest discussion group um, in the world for uh, forecasting. Um, we're having some 250, 300 people. I'm the operating agent of the task. And this book shows you a, a so-called IA Wind recommended practice. And in this case, for actually how to choose and how to implement a renewable energy forecasting solution. So we've looked both into wind and solar and we came with some key recommendations that is essentially analyze your own use case for your forecasts and then find the right evaluation um, procedure for it if you're choosing a forecast. Um, of the quality, reliability and price, um, you typically only get two of them right uh, and then have to figure out what is the third one. Um, and sometimes price um, and value might be actually related for you. So in these performance evaluations, we also show that not all performance evaluations are done equal. And you need to take care of representativeness of your evaluation, of significance um, and of relevance for your actual use case and for your value proposition. One example is shown here where um, we are looking into a wind power ramp, um, quite steep one in this case, uh, where we're coming from not very much power to nearly full power. Um, and we're having three different forecasts. That's a thought example here. One where you have a phase error, one where the ramp is predicted sort of okay, um, but the last part of the ramp um, is less steep than normal. And one where you sort of smooth out um, the ramp, but you get the start and end point right. And if you look at the mean absolute error values, then this one where the ramp is underpredicted, or the, the severeness of the ramp is underpredicted, is actually the one with the lowest MAE. But that's an example of where MAE might not be the most relevant error criterion for you um, to get the best value out of a ramp prediction. The most important market for trading is typically the day ahead market, where you're trading before 12 o'clock every day um, for the next 24 hour day. So you need a, um, at 11 o'clock a 13 um, to 37 hour ahead prediction. Most of the volume of the fork uh, of, of wind power are actually traded on that market. But then since forecasts are getting better, the closer you come to real time, you're um, trading some of the imbalances that you see appearing um, on the intraday market. And you try to not do that too often because every trade does actually have a cost. Um, and then in the, at the very end, you need to settle your final imbalance um, in the real-time market. So there's an optimization going on to allocate the, the trading volumes onto those different timescales. Uh, and that can be made even more complex if you're trading grid services. So at some times, um, as I mentioned, the, uh, at high wind power, um, the prices for the electricity are low. So in, uh, in those cases, it might actually be better to even further downregulate your um, wind park in order to be able to sell upregulation potential. And that is one example of um, the grid services that you can sell, but that would obviously have, a, have an impact of the power that you can sell. This could be even more complex if you have many operators and developers are now doing not only have wind in your system, but wind plus batteries, plus solar, maybe even P2X. Um, so then the whole optimization problem um, is, is actually getting even bigger. And an interesting corollary is that um, the accuracy for the, of the forecasts doesn't necessarily uh, relate to value because you might get the best forecast, um, but if, you're, if, if the best forecast is used by all market participants and all market participants know which one is usually the best forecast, um, then um, the, the entire market might be on the wrong side of reality. And with a forecast on the right side, you might actually um, be better off um, in terms of value. So the um, best performing forecast from an accuracy point of view might not actually be the one that gives you the most value. Having said that, 
uh, there's potential for strategic bidding um, that's not necessarily the most truthful and state-of-the-art bidding um, when putting the error into the transmission system operator. That means typically um, that the transmission system operator will get a much better forecast if they use all the data they have available um, across their grid um, and run that through a top-notch uh, forecasting platform rather than um, just collecting all the individual forecasts that have inhomogeneous quality um, and might actually uh, invite to a strategic bidding um, where you're trying to um, optimize your um, imbalances um, on the background of some possibilities that the grid codes um, avail to you. So in conclusion, you, have, you don't have one forecast that fits all. Um, and you need to figure out which forecast is the one that your particular use case is actually having. Um, we, in, in Wind Task 51, we've actually put out also a number of papers on um, which kind of use cases you can have for forecasts. And the best forecast might not be the one that gives you the best value. And Wind Task 51 has actually put out a recommended practice um, for forecast choice and use, um, and we will use that one afterwards in our exercise.